Wind down, relax, and chill for you. I am going to be reading Slaying the Giants in Your Life by David Jeremiah Part 4. Well, I am going to be reading Chapter 3 since we left off in chapter two i'm gonna read the whole chapter of chapter three liberation from loneliness so go ahead relax listen to me reading to you deep breaths deep breaths deep breaths don't worry about tomorrow let tomorrow worry about itself chapter three Liberation from loneliness. You can win the battle and live victoriously. For Linda, life has too often been another word for goodbye. Linda was raised in a farmhouse during hard times. Great Depression years, poverty, polio, dust storms, tornadoes, and crop failures were the backdrop of her childhood. A German battlefield took her brother. Cancer took her mother. Early on, Linda learned all that there was to know about. Goodbye. The prospect of marriage, however, brought the hope of fresh beginnings. Linda and Richard, the boy she met in a white frame country church, began a new life together. But that, too, was interrupted when the Korean conflict hit the headlines. Linda said goodbye as her new husband left for service and the loneliness returned. Then she said goodbye to her father and father-in-law who died, and a brother and a sister-in-law who were tragically murdered. Richard came home. Maybe a life would finally be filled with joy in a family. Instead, that followed were what followed were years of frustration trying to conceive children. The two found the vacant nest to be a lonely place. That period, too, came to an end. There were eventually children. At first, she found contentment, but Linda discovered that the simple presence of offspring brought no guarantee of happiness. As they grew, the kids made poor decisions that broke their parents' hearts. Decisions leading to un unwed pregnancies, divorces, custody battles, alcoholism, and imprisonment. She missed the little children she had once nestled close. She felt lonelier than ever as years advanced. She and Richard held one another close. And then Richard began to weaken. He was diagnosed with Lou Griggs, Guy Herrig's disease. Did Linda have the strength for this? The most painful goodbye of all. Beth had always been in a hurry. She had bustled down the aisle of her church at the age of nine. 
embracing her new faith with the same eager impatience she gave to everything else. Today she reflects that she would have sought God's will if she hadn't had to wait around for it. There were places to go, people to meet. Beth's impulsiveness brought results she never anticipated. Alcoholism, two failed marriages, two failed marriages, and a single motherhood with six children. Quick decisions had brought her to a place with a few options, and she realized she could never manage her household without some new man in her life. Given her situation, it appears that she couldn't afford it to be selective. Beth's life became an endless series of soap opera reruns, weighed down by one disastrous relationship after another. The men came, used her, and departed again. Beth saw the pattern, but where could she turn? She thought wistfully of God, but hadn't she given her life to him so many years ago? And hadn't he promised to care for her? She believed in him still. She even believed he might forgive her, but her own grace was neither as wide nor as deep. She couldn't forgive herself. Only from the deepest pit did she call his name. From the depths of drunkenness, in the times when some man abused her, as well as during those worst times of all, when she watched her grown children repeat her mistakes. That's when the miracle happened. God answered her prayers. And those of the loving um and those of the mother and loving sister who patiently interceded for her before Almighty God. He became very real to Beth and he began to show her the ugliness of her, her life and the hope of a better one. But happily ever after was delayed. First, Beth was going to have to learn the hard truths of obedience. God began removing from her removing from her life the people, the emotional crutches who kept her from depending fully on God. Her drinking buddy patched up a broken marriage and moved from the state. That was her best friend, but her sisters too married and moved away. She had learned on she had leaned on their support many times, but was facing a turning point in her life and she was facing it alone. Her drinking became worse until even the men stayed away from her. She lived only for her children though she knew how deeply she was falling as in deeply she was failing as a mother. Soon something would have to give. Philip Zimbardo, writing in Psychology Today, has said, There is no more destructive influence on physical and mental health than the isolation of you from me and of us from them. He points to studies that show loneliness as a central agent of depression, paranoia, schizophrenia, rape, suicide, mass murder, and a wide variety of diseases. We've all seen the polls that point to shorter lifespans for lonely people. And when surveys are taken to discover the central concerns of society, loneliness nearly always tops the list. We were created for fellowship, and deprival of it is deadly. Max Lacado writes about walking through a cemetery and coming across a tombstone of one Grace Lulin Smith. No date of birth or death is listed. No facts about her life or work or interests other than the names of her two husbands. But there is this epitaph. E P I T A P H. Epitaph. Well, there's something that was written when it says, Sleeps but rests not, loved but was loved not, tried to please but pleased not, died as she lived alone. So sad.
Lakato found himself wondering, Miss Smith, what broke your heart? He was haunted by those words, died as she lived alone. The chilling realization is that if if Pitifs were always so honest, there would be cemeteries filled with Grace Lou Willin Smiths. We all know her hundreds of times over, and we know it in ourselves. As for Morris West was, I mean, for as Morris West has written, it comes to all of us sooner or later. Friends die. Family dies, lovers and husbands too. We get old, we get sick in a society where people live in personal cities or suburbs where electronic entertainment often replaces one-to-one -one conversation where people move from job to job and state to state and marriage to marriage. Loneliness has become an epidemic. Mm. When was this written? Speaking of epidemics, we are in right now. What is this thing called loneliness? Is it a sick feeling in the stomach that a seltzer water won't cure? It's an anxiety that doesn't come or go, but remains with you at all times and smothers you in the still of night. It's a sharp pain that jolts through you when you hear a certain old song or revive an old memory. It's a subtle stress that quietly wears you down until you feel a devoid out of energy or enthusiasm. Above all, loneliness is a longing for completeness. And how do we handle these unwanted cravings? We seek to fill them with every other thing, from food to drink to drugs to work. We strain the relationships we have by placing obsessive demands on them. We flee into fantasy worlds or to new cities, businesses, churches, and relationships. Some handle loneliness by taking their own lives. Teenagers who experience it deeply and desperately have brought an upsurge in suicide attempts. The recent rash of school shootings bringing anguish to my own neighborhood twice have often been linked to the confusion of loneliness. And yet, it's a crisis we all face. I was preaching on this topic the day after I performed the wedding for my youngest son. He had flown from the nest, and I was already missing him. The experience of loneliness. We can't discuss it problem as widespread as loneliness without exploring some of the many ways it manifests itself. For everyone, it takes a little bit different. I mean, it tastes a little bit different. The diversity of it is expressed so well in the Beatles song about Eleanor Rigby, who picks up rice from the sanctuary floor after people's weddings and lives in a dream. Nearby, Father Mackenzie wipes the dust from the hands after a funeral, feeling the emptiness of life. These two lost souls have gone about their lives almost elbow to elbow, inhibiting the same world without connecting until one buries the other. Life need not be so painful. Let's study a few portraits in loneliness. The Lonely Single I live in the San Diego area, San Diego area, and our city has one of the highest population of single adults in the country. I've met so many of them in our church, and they painted a picture of for me of returning to an empty house, cooking dinner for one, and watching TV shows with no one to discuss them with. Listen to how Anne Kimmel expressed it upon the occasion of a lonely New Year's Eve when she was single. <coughs> Excuse me, 
God. It's New Year's Eve, and I took a hot bath and poured powder and lotion perfume recklessly and dooned my newest long, dainty nightgown. I guess I was hoping all that would erase the agony of being alone in such a gallant, celebrating, profound moment when everyone so likes to be with someone to watch a new year. It hasn't helped too much. I tried to sleep, hoping that would beat away the endless hours, but after all afternoon and two hours tonight, I'm worn out from sleep. I've stumbled from one room to the next, wanting to cry. Oh God, the walls are so silent and there is no one around to laugh and change the subject. I so wish for a friend's lap to bury my head and let my tears spill unabashedly and freely. Some would say, oh, stop the pity party. Why indulge in self-pity? But there are many more who would say I recognize those feelings. There was a time when I could have written that poem myself about New Year's Eve, about a solitary Christmas season, about a 4th of July with no fireworks, or about any of the long months that stretch between them. Or the lonely spouse. Oh, I just bit my tongue. The lonely spouse. Many single people have been shocked to discover that marriage is, is no sure fire. Pansia, Panacea, P A N A C E A, P A N A C E A, for loneliness. Among the loneliest souls in those this world are married people. Among the loneliest souls in this world are married people. Excuse me. Though God himself created the glorious institution of matrimony, he put, he put husbands and wives together to provide perfect oneness and intimacy. The miracle of two souls becoming one flesh. Yet we squander the gift this point was brought home to me in a week this point was brought home to me in a week when we when i had just preached on the subject a woman wrote to tell me i'd hit a sensitive spot tragic but true she said i try not to dwell on the loneliness of marriage but the truth is i am lonely my husband and i are both christians he is a good man who works hard and provides for me but all that work keeps him from being there to meet my emotional needs we're like two ships who pass in the bathroom i don't want to nag i simply try not to think about the herd and the emptiness but in the end i'm still lonely the lonely survivor It's also possible to have a full, abundant marriage and lose the one on whom you've come to depend. It's a bittersweet gift to be the savior of a marriage ended in death. I've counseled those who have told me that words can't express the emptiness of losing a soulmate. Life has been constructed of shared experiences, shared feelings, shared preferences in restaurants and furniture and music so many thousands of little things linking two spirits your spouse has truly become a part of you and now that part is gone there is no complete healing for such a wound there's also the experience of divorce more manifest in our times than any other if you haven't been through that valley of shadow you know those who have again the lonely survivor must bring a new life out of a chaos of loss. And in this case, there are feelings of failure, recrimination, rejection, unfinished business, 
parental guilt, so many dark byproducts of the divorce phenomena. Or the divorce feelings can be tinged with bitterness. The lonely senior citizen. Every day, the pet the percentages increase. That assisted living centers grow more crowded, more gray hairs sprout on head and mind. Every one of us is growing older. There's nothing new in that. I know how many who are caring for their children and their aging parents simultaneously, and they know that. And they know that retired people have acute attention needs that are a challenge to me. Senior citizens feel the hurt of giving their lives to children who now simply don't have time for them or don't have as much time as their parents would like. They've discovered how wonderful the gift is to be needed and how difficult we find it on that day when no one needs us anymore. They can remember great accomplishments, the respect of the community, a house filled with friends and family. They've seen their friends and their spouses pass from this life. It seems no one is left who remembers, no one who understands. The golden years weren't supposed to be like this. They were supposed to have luster. The Bible speaks of gray hair as a crown to be honored by the community, not a mark of obsolescence to be scorned. Some lonely seniors find themselves wondering why they're still lingering in this life. The lonely sufferer. I'll never forget the letter I once read in a book called Loneliness is Not Forever. A man was attempting to describe the pain that he had become his reality. He wrote, it was when the lights went out and the room was suddenly plunged into darkness that the awful awareness came. The traffic of the hospital went on like an uncontrolled fever outside my door. But inside the room it became still. So still that you could sense, even believe that the walls were moving and the room was becoming smaller. I was never a lonely person up until then. But now I knew what it was. My family had gone home together to that familiar safe place, but I was here alone, isolated, facing the uncertainties uncertainties of what hospitals mean. Physical problems have emotional symptoms because pain isolates us. Misery loves company, but it depends in solitude we feel all alone we feel no one understands our pain and we feel very lonely the lonely servant of god in this world are a few courageous souls who are willing to lay everything before god their time their work even their homes they serve all across the world in the mission field quietly and often forgotten they've left behind family and friends everything familiar you and i too often go all about our lives without stopping to give them a thought or a prayer of blessing this man or woman serves god in an alien culture struggling with language and customs and loneliness i'd love to show you my letters from missionary friends who describe the experience of being disconnected they're Connected to high purpose, of course, and God has special rewards for them. But in the here and now, it can be a lonely life. The lonely servant of God may be isolated by leadership too. In, num in Numbers 11, chapter 11, verse 14, Moses spoke of the heavy burden of trying to carry the decent destiny of so many people that's a burden that weighs us down we say that it's lonely at the top and that's true 
but the leader is not at the top. He's beneath the heavy burdens of those in the crowd. This change in his charge. And if those at the top are really at the bottom, here's another paradox to ponder. The one who walks out front must turn his back on those who walk behind him. It's true. Leadership too isolates. Leaders of great churches and large ministries can be very lonely people. It simply comes with the territory. These are all pictures of loneliness. I hope we can agree that it's no sin to be lonely. It's a symptom of being human, of being created in the image of the God who first made us become. Oh, I hope we can agree that it's no sin to be lonely. It's a symptom of being human of being created in the image of the God who first made us because he delighted in fellowship. 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 Examples of loneliness in the Bible. David the King. David the King. So many of the psalms present the most eloquent evocations of loneliness in the history of literature. David understood the subject deeply. He knew what it was like to hide in the coolness of caves as the soldiers hunted him down. Yet he also knew what it was like to sit upon the throne. Whether he was despised or exalted, there was loneliness to contend with contend with. Here are only two of countless examples. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are buried like a hearth. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and am like a sparrow alone on the housetop. Psalm chapter 102, um, verses 3, 6, and 7. Look on my right hand and see there is no one who acknowledges me. The refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. And that's in Psalm chapter 142 verses 4 whenever I feel lonely it helps me to know that a man as a as great as King David a man after God's own heart could feel just as I do I commend you to the Psalms when the solitude overcomes you there you'll find a lively and fully human friend who shares your feelings. Oh, this reading is getting me tired. Jeremiah the prophet. This Jeremiah, the author, points you to that one. The prophet. His story is one of the most heart-trending you're ever likely to read. The book, the book of Lamentations is a kind of spin-off of Jeremiah's own book. Excuse me, let me take my gum off. Up. Trash it. Later. Excuse me, sorry. Where were we? Lamentations is a kind of spin off of Jeremiah's own book, for the two were originally one large book. We don't read Lamentations very often today because most people aren't attracted to funeral poetry. 
that's what these verses are. Jeremiah wrote them down as he watched his beloved city of Jerusalem go up in flames for his eyes. He watched his people fall apart and their culture and heritage swept away. The prophet preached against all this, of course, and he knew no one would listen to his words. Today we remember Jeremiah as a weeping prophet because of the tears he shed over fallen Jerusalem. It's difficult to preach a message everyone ignores, and the life of Jeremiah stands as a testimony to that fact. His deep loneliness is an agonizing thing to read and study. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place for wayfaring men, he wrote, that I might lead my people and go from them, where they are all adulterers and uh, an assembly of treacherous men. Jeremiah chapter 9 verses 2. He was sick of the whole spectacle. He was saying, if I could just find a cheap motel out in the desert, I'd check in and never check out. That's an expression of the alienation he felt. Being a prophet is a lonely experience. Paul the Apostle. Paul. Paul the Apostle, even the New Testament, bursting with its good news of redemption for all humanity, has its share of loneliness. Consider the case of great New Testament evangelist and teacher Paul the Apostle. He was a human author of much of the New Testament, the founder of countless missionary churches, and the mind behind the book of Romans, the greatest treatise of the theology ever conceived. Paul went everywhere, spoke multiple languages, knew everyone, and he experienced deep loneliness. The last of his letters is to Timothy, for he was writing to that younger man who was his closest friend. He was writing to a younger man, which was his closest friend. Here's Paul at the end of a life crowned by staggering achievements, and he describes the grief of his solitude. Listen to his heart. So, listen to his heart. We are going to read Paul's the Apostle's heart to his closest friend. So, let us continue to read what he had to say. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia. Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 11 and 16. I think that's Galatia, G-A-L-A-T-I-A. Galatia Titus for Dalmatia, D-A-L-M-A-T-I-A. But anyways, may it not be charged against them. 
Do you feel the pain that blows through those verses? Such a great man who has poured out his life for these very churches, and he stands alone. At this point in his life, he qualifies for many of the cate categories we've already described. He is a lonely servant of God, a lonely sufferer with his thorn in the flesh, a lonely senior, even a lonely single adult. He may be the in incomparable Apostle Paul, but he feels your pain. It's possible to accomplish so much, so bless so many, change the world so explosively, and still experience the icy chill of solitude. In this, at least, you're not alone. Well, that's very powerful. It, it's, an, it's possible to accomplish so much, bless so many, change the world so explosively, and still experience the icy chill of solitude. In this, at least, you're not alone. Feeling lonely is not a sin. We sin when we begin to indulge it. Feeling lonely is not a sin, but we sin when we begin to indulge it. We sin when we begin ignoring the biblical prescription for confronting it. We sin when we begin ignoring the biblical prescription for confronting it. We sin when we let it possess us and ruin our lives. We sin when we let it possess us and ruin our lives, but we need not to fall into that sin. The Bible offers us an escape. The Bible offers us an escape. And I have this Bible just in case you need it to open it for reference. And um, after this reading, I might read some. just in case we need to open it up. Liberation from loneliness. Liberation from loneliness. Liberation from loneliness. Liberation from loneliness. Acknowledge the real reality of your loneliness. The first thing you need to do is to be honest about your feelings. And the last thing you need to do is resort to poise palatitudes. Loneliness is a real and it is loneliness is real and it is painful. It is no way a reflection of weakness as a Christian or a member of society. It is no way a reflection of weakness as a Christian or a member of society. We as Christians love the poise palitudes, however, platitudes, however. A. W. Tozer has some instructive words for us about the layers of superficial gloss with which we cope real problems. Some say brightly, Oh, I, ne I am never lonely. Christ said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And lo, I am with you always. So how can I ever be lonely when Jesus is with me? Now, I do not want to reflect on the sincerity of any Christian soul, but this stock, testimony is to need to be real 
it is obviously what the speaker thinks should be true rather than what he has proved to be true by the test of experience. I know you've run into this kind of thing before. You try to tell a friend about your feelings and before you can even finish your friend flashes a spiritually smug smile and issues poise platitude. Number 437. Such stock replies leaves us cold because they deny the reality of human experience and struggle. These sentiments are technically true, of course, but they're also insensitive, insensitive and unrealistic about the fallen world we live in. We need encouragement, not ceremonizing, and we need clear-eyed acknowledgement of the situation, not a sanctified gloss that pushes us toward saying, I see I must not admit my pain because, after all, I'm a Christian. I'll just have to cover it up. Jesus is with me, so I suppose I have no right to feel lonely, even for a moment. Let me assure you, there is nothing Christian at all about such a perspective. We are to face our struggles, whatever they may be, clearly with no denial. Loneliness doesn't necessarily come because of something you did, or something someone else did, or because of something you lack. It comes because you are a human being, and it's given to each of us to be lonely for a reason. Accept it as a part of human experience. Then you'll be able to move on to God's way of dealing with it. That's really powerful, actually. I like that. It gives me insight to myself. And if ever anyone was feeling lonely, don't gloss it with sanctification gloss and saying just because you're Christian you should feel this way. But that I could fully understand about the perspective of that person or even myself to just because we're Christian we shouldn't feel like struggles or loneliness and that's something really to look into and to put into heart and think about. Accept God's provision for your loneliness. We need to remember that only God can ultimately solve our problems, including this one. When something is broken, we consult the original manufacturer, and for human beings, God is the original manufacturer. He created us with certain attributes, and one of them is to is that we have an emptiness only he can fill people can't cover it though he gave us a separate need for them neither money nor things can fill the void nothing in this world will ultimately satisfy us short of knowing the one who made us so the most basic loneliness of humanity is the loneliness of estrangement from god it has no remedy but one for more than three decades, I've been a people watcher. I can tell if you are a believer or not simply by observing how you handle your problems. If you lack the inner strength of a godly man or woman, you'll finally buckle under the stress, the strife, and the struggles. You will lack the most basic resource for dealing with the most basic problem. But if you know him, He's here's what happens. You connect you're connected to someone who came into the world, hung on a cross and experienced ultimate loneliness, so you would never have to do so. How is that so? Hear the cry of Jesus in Matthew chapter twenty seven verse forty six. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
at that moment he carried the sin of you and everyone else on his bruised and bleeding shoulders in any other case you would have been ostracized o s t r a c i z e d ostracized from god's present forever because of your sin and rebellion while he would have enjoyed perfect fellowship because of his perfection instead he forfeited that perfect fellowship for you and for me he took the punishment we had in store which meant the black loneliness of god his father turning his back on him perfect light can have no fellowship with darkness now you and i walk in the light we can know god intimately intimately as he as his beloved children it's possible to know liberation from loneliness in the warmth of his love it happens as we embrace his lordship over us and he takes residence within us he fills that void and we begin to know peace and fulfillment and abundance the spirit of god is glowing from our hearts just where he is supposed to be as just as god planned for us there may be moments of disconnection and loneliness but the ultimate kind is no longer a threat to us it's important to acknowledge this point if you don't know jesus there's nothing else that can be done there are no other options if you do know jesus then every hope and joy is possible for you miracles can happen the storehouse of heaven is open to you the fellowship of the saints is available to fulfill your longings for companionship above all the spirit of god in your heart can identify with everything you experience he will be there not to poke at you and accuse you but to gently encourage you comfort you and point you to a better way a better way a better way better 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 way why would anyone use this awesome gift have you accepted it have you accepted it have you accepted it have you accepted it have you accepted Allow God's word to fill your mind and heart. Now, having acknowledged your feelings and embraced your faith, you can immerse yourself in God's word. Let it overflow from your mind and your heart. The voice of God will speak with clarity to the lonely. You need only open the pages of the ancient book, as millions have done across centuries across the centuries
The voice of God will speak with clarity to the lonely. You need only open the pages of the ancient book, as millions have done across the centuries. It has comforted them, regardless of their time, their place, or their particular struggles. No poious platitude here, just the truth. The word of God will soothe and encourage you. Oh, there are so many wonderful passages for you in your time of loneliness. It's a challenge to know where to begin, but try these two for starters. Try these two for starters. My, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Psalm chapter 27 verse 10. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 through 6. Any list of verses would go on for many pages but these two alone are packed with enough power to recharge your batteries when you're running on empty go first to god's word run don't walk activate your network of christian friends One, two, three, three, three more pages, three more pages, three more pages. You should also run to the fellowship of other believers. There is always this promise. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. 1 John chapter 1 verses 7. The next statement may seem rather blunt, but it's true. Loneliness is a choice, not the isolation moments we all experience, but lingering per perva pervasive loneliness. God has provided you with everything you need. And if you choose to do, dwell in the lifestyle of loneliness, that's a choice we've made. He has given us his son. He has given us his word. Then he has given us the precious gift of our brothers and sisters in faith. Simon and Garfunkel once sang, I am a rock, I am an island. But the Bible sung is that Jesus is the rock so that you need never be an island. That's why God made the provision of the church. Most of the books of the New Testament are written to whole congregations. And every time the word saint appears, it's always in the plural because of the concept of Christian individualism. It is an oxymoron. It's foreign to biblical Christianity. We are incomplete without the unity of believers serving one another through their partial, particular gifts. Ooh, that makes me so excited. That sounds really exciting. I want to read it again. That's why God made the provision of the church. Most of the books of the New Testament are written to whole congregations. And every time the word saint appears, it's always in the plural because the concept of Christian 
Christian individualism is an oxymoron. It's foreign to biblical Christianity. We are incomplete without the unity of believers serving our uh, serving one another through their particular gifts. You don't know anyone? Well, he who would have a friend must show himself friendly. Proverbs chapter 18 verses 24. Proverbs chapter 18, 18, 18, 18 verse 24. You don't like to take the initiative? How will anyone know about you if you don't make yourself known? You feel no one really cares? It's hard to care about a face in the crowd. No one knows your needs if you linger in the background. Loneliness is a choice. A good church in your area offers a wide array of opportunities for you to connect. Join the choir. If you don't like to sing, join a Bible study group. If you can't get there, join a Sunday school class. There are organizations, meals, programs, presentations, all of which have been established to help you connect and use the spiritual gifts you're assured of having by virtue or, I mean, um, use the spiritual gifts you, you're assured of having by virtue of being a Christian. Let me particularly suggest that you volunteer for service great relationships are forged in collaborating for good cause here's a passage i love that extols the virtues of simple companionships extols, 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 extols. two are better two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor for if they fall one will lift up his companion but woe to him who is alone when he falls for he has no one to help him up up again if two lie down together they will keep warm but how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a three chord is not quickly broken. Ex exil I, I, this is always so hard for me to say. Ex Exilastes. Ex Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, oh man, I always have trouble saying this chapter in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, I mean, I um, um, had a point in my life where I was trying to say it, Ecclesiastes, and I always forget how to say it. But excuse me for that, you guys. I'm gonna um, look it up and see how we say how to say exchisliastes. Hold on, how to pronounce exchisliastes? Sorry. Let me go ahead and um play it on here so I can be remembered how to say it. Two-edged sword. In this word. Excuse me. Ecclesiastes. Oh, Ecclesi Ecclesiastes. 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 Oh, I was close. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 12. My church once built a ministry upon that last verse. We called it the triple chord prayer ministry. Take a piece of string and you can snap it with little effort, but intertwine it with two other chords as it will withstand all your efforts to break it together. We're greater than the 
some of our parts. This is a godly principle at the very center of how God works in the world. He works through people intertwined together, even with all the messy knots and entanglements of our being involved together. Alone, we are so limited together. We can forge movements that change world history. Our gifts multiply and multiply again. My gifts for ministry are not in my tongue that preaches my mouth that projects it. My fingers that turn the pages and reach out to serve others, but what would any of these parts be without the others that's paul's point body parts are only so much bio biological tissue but when we come together they live to and breathe and have life god wants you to be so much more than biological tissue he wants you to be a part of something alive and dynamic and greater than yourself Searching for strays. Very powerful read. God also wants you to reach out to make the cord stronger. Yes, I've charged the lonely with taking the initiative. But I think each of us also has the responsibility to look out for the stray sheep. Just as Jesus spoke of leaving the 99 to seek out the lone lamb. You and I have a special ministry in holding in, in those who are strangled and alienated. We should, we should rise on Sunday morning, have our time with God, and ask him to send us to the one who needs us the most. It's easy for us to gravitate to the great herd of sheep where com we are comfortable and loved that's a good thing but let's also go where needed the ministry of acceptance and encouragement is our distinguishing mark in this world many today know the name of Anne Frank whose family was imprisoned in its own home during the second world war we read about the family's troubles in the diary that Anne kept all the, through the experience millions have read it or seen the movie based upon it. This family lived every day with the fear of discovery, and yet along with the calastrophobia and daily fear, and nurtured other feelings in her heart, including joy. And spoke of climbing the ladder to the loft and looking out of the blue sky. She said, as long as a, this exists, I thought, this sunshine and this cloudless, sky cloudless sky the sunshine and this cloudless sky and as long as i can enjoy it how can i be sad she reminds us that we can lose everything external people things even prestige even prestige but the happiness in your own heart can only be dimmed you and i can have that kind of overcoming hope as we look to the heavens but our hope is not in clouds or sun or sky we can have jesus christ the lord of the universe living in us the ground beneath us may crumble and the skies may pour torrential rain or the chaos of the whirlwind but those things are not internal as he is the light of day lasts a few hours and the light of a lifetime burns for perhaps 80 years but the light of the savior shines now and forever that's why my circumstances don't define me don't limit me don't even thrill me my hope is in him and he will never fail he will never depart. He will always be greater than our needs, just as my friend Linda discovered. Remember Linda, the goodbye girl? Life for her had been all about separation, and the hardest of all was the death of her husband. Before he succumbed to 
G. Rake's disease. There was a lengthy period of illness, a long goodbye. But during that time, something changed in Melinda. She saw the grace and peace written across his face in the little notes and gestures after he lost his ability to speak. Linda knew that God was the source of his courage and joy in the face of death itself. Today, I walk in a deep sorrow and loneliness, loneliness Linda admits. However, I don't journey alone. My Savior walks with me, surrounding me with internal love. Soon my life's road will make a final bend homeward, and I'll see my husband and my Lord face to face. Praise God. And how about Beth? What about what happens when your life is in chaos? You meet God and things become even bleaker. God seemed to be subtracting friends and emotional crutches from her life. She felt so lonely and even intensified her drinking. The voice of the deceiver was whispering in her ear, You're no good. It's too late for you, and soon your children will be mine. Every day, as she returned home from work, Beth listened to Christian radio. There was a sermon series on the power of prayer, and Beth began to try the principles she was hearing her sense of worthlessness became to drain away replaced by an incredible feeling of her supreme value to god she looked into church activities and soon she actually found herself counseling others imagine such a thing satan had said she was worthless but god was telling her that the depth of her pain could be useful to others most amazing of all god began to move through the lives of beth's children like a sudden gust of heavenly wind seeing the change in their mother made a difference in time as she leaned to depend on him god opened channels for her to spend time with her children she was able to move to a new home closer to them today she has a thriving ministry to women in her church through bible study and she's living proof that loneliness and things even the worst can be overcome in god's almighty power beth thinks about the past quite often she says those were the worst and best days of my life god met me when i needed him the most but most important he prepared me for the changes i had to undergo can you find god in the maze of lonely and confused feelings can you grasp that he may be prepared he may be preparing you for a fresh life and a fresh hope he will never leave you nor forsake you reach out take his hand and discover what it means to lay slay the giant of loneliness and you guys that was chapter three of slain the giants in your life by david jeremiah all righty my forget me nots i hope this gave you encouragement tingles or i hope you're fast asleep and even inspiration i hope